Hi, I'm George from Pavlicek Studios and I will be making a glass marble today. I'm going to be making out of glass rods on a propane oxygen torch. For those of you who've seen me do it before, um, you might know that I use a uh, mid-range torch, but I haven't taken the opportunity to show you many times. Um, this one is from the 1990s. This was the second torch I ever started using. That's what's called a surface mix. Um, it works great for uh, tiny stuff as well as marbles on up to about an inch and a half. And then it starts struggling. Um, I have used some bigger torches and some other brands before, uh, but I like the controls on this one best um, for their simplicity. Um, I should have, I didn't know I was going in this direction, otherwise I could have showed you all my other torches. The thing I was going to talk about today before I started marble making was um, materials preparation. Many times when I get my glass rods, I get them as uh, clear glass rods in a variety of sizes. Here's some color uh, in give you a size reference. This is what I would refer to as a large rod. Um, I also have uh, some more medium size rods. And then, of course, I have uh, smaller rods. This is uh, a, a sm about a four millimeter rod I pull myself um, when I want to do small encasing. I normally get them in the five to seven range. Um, and the, the quality varies a lot depending on where you're getting them from and when. Um, and a lot of the color that I use, I don't need to use it in volume. I need, I'm using uh, small amounts at a time. And so I want to pull rods that are smaller in diameter. This is it's a, about a two or three millimeter rod. And that's great for doing uh, dots of a consistent size or uh, lines of a, of a a wider width doing a striped marble of some sort. And then if you've seen me make my flower marbles and some of my other tinier work, I have a one millimeter broad size that I pull for that. And that's almost fine pencil line work. So I'm gonna fire up the torch and uh, show you some one millimeter and some two and three millimeter rod poles. And then we're going to make a uh, winter storm uh, holiday marble. It's going to be a, a, a maelstrom of gold, of silver foil leaf flakes uh, with some green and red ribbons in it. And uh, the color will be minimal but breathtaking. Maybe. We hope. Alright, so I'm going to put on these glasses, these shield sodium flare and UV and certain infrared spectrums from my eyes. And I have that same filter that's on these glasses on the lens of my camera. So that you can see what's going on inside this flame without getting distracted by a big yellow sodium flare. Which is uh, what you'd see whenever I put in a glass rod into the flame. So if the filter wasn't on there, you'd see a big yellow poof coming off of that. And you don't know because that little filter right there. And now what I also have is a magnifying glass so I can show you what I'm doing. Close up, a little bit bigger, twice as big. Makes a big difference. Um, and let's adjust this down just a hair. And then you can see my torch. And then you can also see uh, Jingles, the Christmas elf, working behind me, uh, fixing a um, a very sad person's menorah candle because they couldn't find the right size candles for their festival of lights tomorrow. And so now she's saving the day. Are you going to show us? No. Okay. There's nothing to show. Right? Alright. It's just uh, a bunch of uh, wooden adapters for a candle. Alright. So. Um. I was pulling, I have arrayed around me if you've seen my pre-show, and you can see them above me a little bit. 
I have all my colors of uh, smaller one millimeter size um, in little test tubes arrayed around me so that when I need a color I can grab it. Um, and what I have been working towards doing is having the next size up available to me and I'm going to have that in uh, a smaller display for some of the other designs that I, I go to a lot but I, I, I find I, I hadn't gone to that level of prep before. Um, and it's just uh, something I've never got around to and I really want to do that. So um, let's pull a little one and then a big one. Red is a color I use all the time for flowers, so let's pull a one millimeter rod. And what I'm going to do is uh, probably the easiest way to do it and the way you'll see most of the lamp workers do it is I've got two rods of that color. I'm heating them up. I flashed them a little bit. Uh, red is a shocky color, which means if you throw, go to put it right in the flame, it's going to pop and sizzle and little bits of the glass are going to come off and it will never start getting to that gather stage where the end of the rod is melting. So now it's melting and I push them together. And now as I melt them and I rotate them, if I angle them like this, that little gather will roll on back onto the rods and get bigger. Each time I melt a little bit, I'll turn it at that angle. It'll roll and make itself a little bit bigger. And I don't want a huge gather because I'm getting, I'm, I'm pulling this down into a small thread. So I might even have too much glass there for what I'm doing right now. But let's get it all nice and wiggly. Um, the consistency of um, glass. <laughs> I want to pull it into a thread. Um, having trouble thinking of what, there's nothing really of the consistency of this that you would use in everyday life. It's more viscous than gum, it's um, less viscous than honey, and so I start to pull it, and then as soon as one part gets down to the diameter that I want, I slow down a little bit, and then the thicker parts, which are still molten, will pull down to that diameter. Um, not kind of like magic, but it's more by your feel. And I'm smacking everything with this. It got really long. Um, but really, it's one of those things. It's just, it's so fun. It gives you the feel of the glass. And look at that. It already uh, cooled down and struck back to its original red color. And that is going to be great for growing little flowers. Now let's set that aside. And right away, let's go do a bigger one. Let's cut a one millimeter pull. And so you can see these ends are still dark because the red turns black before it starts getting molten. And that pull there, that's more along the two or three millimeter line that I want to get, I want to achieve here. So I'll get a gather about the same size, maybe a little bit bigger. And I generally like to pull these just a little, the, the one millimeter ones, I pull long and I make two pieces out of them, um, which gives me s several uh, marbles worth of material. For this three millimeter size, I'm just making myself one piece. And so I'm gonna go slower. And if it starts to droop too much, I can, I can rotate one of these or both of them and gives, give it some twist. Since it's a solid color, it doesn't matter if it gets twisted or not. And then when I get to the end of the portion of the rod where the diameter starts increasing as towards my attachment point of the original rod, I'll melt it off there. And, it, and that's all right. I, that won't be wasted. I'll push it back into the, uh, the rest of the rod. And then so here is my piece there, and we'll show you next to the other piece that's about twice as big. So there's the little one, and there's the bigger one. Not focus. Now, in real life, they look different, but they're looking the same, <laughs> very similar in the lens. Oh look, that's my laser beam, my eyes. <laughs> Right, that's not a marble demo. That's me goofing around. So, my clear rods, 
I use them till they're about halfway gone, and then I can't hold them anymore because they get it gets too hot. So I have to put a little extra glass handle on them, and then I use just junk clear rods that I pulled out of my recycled crucible, or I can just use a clear piece. Um, it doesn't really matter. But so for the construction of the marble that I'm going to begin, I'm going to use my uh, two millimeter rod to, to make my dots. But the first thing I'm going to do is start a stack of dots. Um, and when I say that, I'm going to get a gather going here, I'm going to flatten it, and then I'm going to put things on that, and then another bigger disc of clear over it, and another little dot of metal or color, and then keep adding stuff onto that stack of dots. So I'm building it from one side to the other, but I'm building it through the middle. So let's get our first gather going. A lot of times when you see glass blowers working, what they're doing is they're making the core of the marble first, the center portion. They get it as a ball, and they roll it out into more of a cylindrical uh, ball, and then they decorate that cylinder, and then they case it again, and then they might do that several times. So they're starting the marble from the inside out. From here, we're starting it from one side to the other side, like a, uh, like a medical scanner doing layers of it, and then we'll fuse those layers back together and then start giving them some motion rather than building it from the inside out and then twisting it from the outside in. Seems crazy, but it just might work. Let's try. <laughs> All right, so my clear glass rod is big and it takes a little while to get going. And now you can start to see it's getting orange on the end. When it's when more of it melts, it's going to start forming a ball, and the ball will become larger in diameter than the rod itself. And that's the kind of gather of molten glass I want at the end of my solid rod. And now that it's uh, starting to melt, it's going to pick up speed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the rod basically level and then just angle it back towards my hand a little bit so that the, the stuff on the end starts rolling back down onto the rod itself. And once it gets to the size that I want, I'm going to flatten it out and I'm going to start stacking my layers of dots on it. There's a lot of really fun ways to do stacked dots. It's not a technique you see a lot. Uh, of uh, these days because it works for soft glass and it works for lamp work. It does not lend itself well to glass blowing. It does not lend itself well to borosilicate or hard glass because uh, when you push gathers together in hard glass, there tends to be a visible line that remains. In soft glass, that visible line does not exist if you've uh, merged them at the right temperature. And maybe that's not true. I'd love to hear uh, or see someone's work uh, with borosilicate who uh, is merging surfaces and not getting a, um, a union line. Um, you'll see a lot. Well, I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, that's for someone else's expertise. I can tell you what I've seen and what I think about that. But uh, I think I should probably tell you about my kind of that's what I've been playing with for the last 30 years, and I'm getting a pretty good handle on it. All right, there's my clear gather. Let's flatten it. Think flatten it. Now I'm going to pick up a piece of silver leaf, and there it is on the end of my disc. And let's encase it. So I'm going to start to heat this up way back in the flame uh, without a a binocular view, trust me that this is in the back part of the flame. You probably see that. And then this rod I'm flashing. This one. This one here. This one right here. <laughs> I'm flashing into the flame farther back. By flashing I mean I'm waving it back and forth through the flame to bring it up to temperature slowly so that it doesn't explode. And the end is starting to glow orange so I don't I 
can stop flashing it. And let it get its first gather going. So now, um, when I start stacking these dots, and I'm using a larger rod, like the raw material I showed you at the beginning of the demonstration, um, a bigger rod is going to leave a larger volume of glass when you put a dot or a stripe uh, as decoration. And so, using a smaller diameter rod, you're going to use and deposit less glass onto the surface you're decorating. And so, when you're squishing two liquids together, the more liquid you add for your decoration, um, the more it has to, the more it has to displace the glass around it. And so you're going to get a change in the design from application to merging as a cohesive glass item, which generally means. If you add a big glob of something to decorate, it's going to squish around and uh, influence your design. If you want it to squish around and squish into other things and smear your previous work, that's great. If you don't, you want to use less glass and you want to control the amount of heat where it joins and the amount of heat when you start merging it into the hole. And that is essentially the boring part. <laughs> <laughs> the most exciting part is getting to go, ah, oh, squish. So I added that clear gather on top of my silver foil, and I've essentially made another stacked dot on top of it. So there's my silver foil again, but this time, oh yeah, it's inside there. All right. <clears throat> now, here's my smaller little red rod and I'm going to heat the end till it melts and then I'm going to leave a series of dots. I made a dot in the center. Let's make an array of dots around it. There, I made a hexagonal array of dots. And now, just for fun, and because I like to give my marbles invisible powers, I'm going to add some UV black light glass dots next to the ones that I put in there. Let's melt those dots into the surface a bit, and then when the top of the dot gets hot and the disc itself is cooler, I can press those dots into the surface behind it, and they have not increased in size too much. That's what I wanted. Now let's get my big clear rod and start flashing it, because I'm going to add another gather over top of that. And then we're going to add clear over there and do another row of dots, but this time in green. And probably some more UV glass in there, so it'll look really cool when we put a black light on it. It'll look like a completely different marble with the UV glass. But it won't affect the design that we're doing. It just makes it a cool secondary design. So there's something extra for the person who owns the marble can go, oh, watch this. This marble has a secret. Or, I don't know. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> I'm just having fun making it. All right, this is getting big and gloopy. So let's put that gather on top of there. There it is. Let's flatten it out. 
to about the same diameter as that previous one. There's our dots encased, the visible and the invisible ones. Now let's get a green, smaller rod, and make little tiny dots. I'm going to try to put those dots in between those first dots that we had, just for a little offset. And try to find my little tiny UV thread. Alright, so we melted those. And, and you can see their offset of that first set of dots. And this thread is very small, so I'm going to turn my flame down. I'm going to put these dots a little bit farther out. To give it another interior dimension. So that I'm not stacking everything right above each other, so that when you turn it, it's all in the same plane. I want it to be going in and out of that plane that's going around. So like if you have the core of the marble and then the, the like that mesosphere, mesosphere layer and then the outside layer, the crust, in that middle layer, I want to be going in and out and in and out from the surface delving to the core with these dots. So first I've stacked them and then I'm going to change the axis of them and then I'm going to rotate them. And then once I've rotated them and made the first shell, I'm going to switch my axis of rotation and twist them more so then it's going to interleave. Or not. We'll see. I could have just made that up. You have to try it yourself. You can do it with uh, Play-Doh, or chewing gum, or Silly Putty, but you won't be able to see inside. So you'll have to do it all, and then cut it open with a knife, and then look at what's inside. Which is actually a really, really fun project. If you've ever uh, played with Play-Doh with kids, you can like take a bunch of little snakes that you've made and roll them up and then cover them with a sheet and then make a ball and then um, you know, roll up the little snakes and twist them around in different ways and then cover them with a sheet and then cut them up in different uh, ways, in different planes and you can see all kinds of different shapes. So uh, you're welcome or I apologize. How's that? <laughs> Apologize for the mess. You're welcome. If anyone discovers any new subatomic particles and causes some sort of Play Doh fissionable accident in your den. <laughs> Alright, anyway, I did melt in those surface of those green dots, and you can see the ones in the, in the layer below already are getting some refraction, some lens action from the clear glass above them. And so we're just going to multiply that by putting some more layers on there. Yeah, it's super cool. And then we'll turn on the black light and it'll be like, whoa. And then you look at it, it'll be like, <gasps> and then I'll look at it and go, see? And it'll go, what? It'll be like we had a whole conversation. And all we did was look at the marble. So, yeah, I'm dubious too. <laughs> You're right. Suspicious. Alright, let's get this next gallon on there. There goes. La, la, la. That was kind of a juicy one. There we go. Now I'm going to pick up some silver right away while that's hot. 
There it is. Whoa, it's way out of the center. I don't care. That's gonna make it cooler. <laughs> if I had another piece, I would uh, ready. I would pick that up. Cause see it. The uh, when I went to pick it up, the rouge paper underneath um, caught fire from the superheated glass approaching it, and poofed it up off of my marver plate and changed its position, and also blew through the the foil. See. When I, went to, when I went to pick it up, it was right in the center, but as I approached it, that paper vaporized and exploded. Localized convective currents. And yeah, but I'm going to say that's, that's uh, artistic birth. <laughs> Not a mistake. <laughs> Not an error. <laughs> that was my Christmas elf. Helping me out in the background. Just making uh, noises of Christmas industry behind me. You might be able to hear. <laughs> Suspicious glass does sound like a good pump. And instead of drums, it's just sampled breaking glass sounds. This is a long time fantasy of mine. <laughs> So the one thing on this marble, this is kind of, this is a little variation on some other designs that I make, but I'm going to do something that I don't normally do at the end. Once we get this, everything built, I'm going to put a, uh, a few stripes of white on the outside of the marble. And it's going to be, um, they're going to be very tiny stripes, but the opaque and white it's very difficult to rarefy. So you can take a tiny piece of white glass, just a dot or a little piece of stripe, and, uh, and stretch it 20, 30 times its original length. And once it cools down, you'll still be able to see that. Even if it's not as a white stripe, it will be as a almost a two-dimensional razor blade looking separation of the glass like a is it a crack am i even seeing that is that like a dimensional doorway i don't even know but that's looking weird freaking out and that's what i want i want you to freak out a little bit <laughs> now just a cool look um there's a couple of opaque colors that do that really nicely uh they they resist rarefying if you pull them through a clear background. Um, if you pull them through other opaque colors, other opaque colors tend to be very uh, uneven in their viscosity. And even in their initial color mixing and chemistry is uneven. So, uh, but a clear glass pulling some of those opaque colors through, uh, just you can pull it for a mile and it will uh, make a really nice line that will go that you know it will, it will thin out evenly over the distance that you pull it so like if you had a tootsie roll or something like that and you pulled it the ends might pull really fast and it would end up being like a lemon shape or maybe a long uh, pencil shape but with pencil points on the end but if you pull that same uh, tootsie roll and you could pull it out for like 10 feet long, it would pull out to like an almost an invisible thread, but somehow you could still see that thread magnified by the clear around it. Hey, these brown for me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I was, um, I was really curious about that brown spray paint. It looks so wet, even. It does. It's a great uh, spray paint. But when I looked at it over there on the bench light, it looks like I missed some areas. I, you won't care for that project, probably, but. Thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. 
I knew I was going to be using the fume hood for those silk screens, uh -huh. and I didn't want to hold you up. I got an, a screen in there right now, because that's uh, dark in there, so I, I can leave it in there without exposing it. Yeah. All right, and the side, sorry, talking other projects. Uh, Barb is making a circular staircase for cats. Um, I'm going to leave that one right there. <laughs> and so she was had some, I picked her up some of those metal L-shaped brackets to hold up ceiling fan blades, which she's going to use for the stairs for the cats. Anyway, the white is ugly, so I painted it. Plus, I love spray painting stuff. All right, so I finished my stack dots, and I'm starting to melt them together. You can see all the dots in there, two layers. And on either side of those dot layers is the metal. So I'm just going to heat up this, clean up this end a little bit, and hemisphere it up a little bit more. Then I'm going to get a metal handle on there. And uh, then I'll fix this other end and make it spherical. I'm not fixing it. It's not broken. I'm just going to improve its shape. Anyway, so this old um, metal closet that we got from a neighbor who was moving, we picked it up for free, and I'd used it for a while to store some stuff, and I was like, ah, this is kind of big and, and kludgy, so I put it up on wheels. I was like, eh, it's still, it's okay, but it's not great. And then uh, my wife, Barb, was getting interested in airbrushing stuff and got this little mini airbrush, and I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have a little spray booth? For it. So I uh, had like some, I've got all these little bathroom fans and inline fans to do the ventilation for my glass and soldering and all kinds of stuff. So I have, I had an array of those and so I had one that was like a, an old bathroom fan and I rigged that and I ran it outside so you can plug in that little fan and then you can spray paint stuff in there and just have all the fumes and the vapors vent right outside. But, I'm finding more and more uses for it. Like I just made some, if any of you know how to silk screen back from high school or college graphic arts class, you uh, put this photo emulsion on these screens and then it has to dry, but it has to dry in the dark. And then, oops, and then it has to remain in the dark before you expose it like a piece of film. And so for the, the silk screen, what you do is you take your design and you transfer it to a transparency on a laser printer or any, uh, you know, photocopier, something electrostatic, not a, an inkjet or anything like that. You need something where it's really going to melt the toner to the surface of the transparency. Then you put, take your screen out and you put it on a flat surface and you put your transparency on there and then you put a piece of glass down to hold the transparency over the photo emulsion on the screen. Then you take a big light out and you put it straight down at a certain distance and you set a timer and you expose it for that amount of time that you've determined is perfect. And then you rinse away everything that hasn't been exposed, so the dark portions of the transparency becomes the, uh, the film portion that you're washing away. <clears throat> and then the rest remains, and you can uh, you know, do some cleanup on it, but then when you squeegee ink through that screen, then the ink goes through wherever the dark patches um, were that didn't get hardened by light, and they um, become... And if you uh, send me your note I will now give you credit for your college graphic arts class. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. <laughs> Making stuff is fun. I've always loved uh, making, uh, doing silk screen stuff and doing printing things. Um, and this looks neat right now because you can see 
now that it's melted, you can see all those layers of dots that we've done and the silver in there. Now I'm just going to clean up the sphericalness of this. Anyway, I took graphic communications in uh, high school, and that was a blast. You got to use the dark room and uh, made t-shirts. We made Star Trek-related ones, of course, um, because, you know, we were always super popular. <laughs> but then, you needed an art for college, too, and I was doing uh, science crap, and lo and behold, graphic arts, making some t-shirts again. I, I actually, I made t-shirts as, as an aside, but there was like some other uh, photographic methods that we were doing uh, for, for making maps, cartography, which uh, the, the year I finished college, um, they started releasing satellite GIS Data, which made all of my hand drawing uh, cartography degree stuff completely useless. Super fun. Now, look at all those dots and layers of silver. There's the one that kind of poofed out. Is it? No, that was the good one, the good side. This is the one that's uneven because it poofed up. Dots in between. Now let's see. I'm going to switch to this way. So let's do that first. I'm going to switch to my first axis change. So that's going to be my new axis right here up top. So I'm going to melt this one off and detach it. And then I'm going to add those exterior stripes um, in the white opaque that I was telling you about. And I haven't done this for many, many years. This, um, that opaque white stuff was a kind of a fun experiment of a guy I used to know who I believe he sort of fell off the planet. I think he has passed away now because he's older. But we used to uh, send a lot of uh, marbles and glass and pictures back and forth through the mail and then do some of the same shows um, around the Midwest. But he had some really cool techniques. And I have incorporated a lot of, um, I think, the the ideas, um, but since our techniques started off so different, I don't think I uh, stepped on his feet of any of his designs ever. You always want to, you know, uh, make things your own if you can. So I'm going to put some stripes on this. I don't want him to go all the way to the pole. I want him to be just in the middle of a third of the marble. I'm going to do two of them. So, just a stripe there in the middle equator. A stripe there in the middle of the equator. And let's see what happens with that. I sort of have a visual idea that when I start spinning this around, like one, if you anchored one point, the other one's going to go around a few times. And then when we switch the axis again, we're going to change it. Um, so I know in my mind what it's going to look like. Um, I'm very curious to see what really happens matches up. It's like uh, last week I was doing a design that I always do, but I wanted to I wanted it to be like different, looser, um, not as uh, precise and tight. And so I, I made it looser, and it came out really nice. And then this week I made, I did like two sessions where I did four of those each and I just could not recapture what I had been doing. 
and they looked neat, but it, it wasn't the same. Something else either crept in there or got eliminated. And so I was joking with my wife. It's like, I'm going to have to watch my own demo to see what the hell I did. <laughs> I've often wrestled with the idea that I should go back and edit my demos and put an intro on and uh, do some splash screens and some text and maybe some credits, uh, you know, links and so forth. But I also think that part of the process is watching the whole process. And that there's value in that. Like this the idea that you can fast forward through everything and that you can time lapse it and you can watch a video of something and become an expert just by watching the highlights. Or the only enjoyment you can get is watching things when they are moving or you know the the person falls off the pier. Um, you know, but I want, what's that, what's that person doing before he fell off the pier? Um, is that funny? Does that contribute to the story? Is that important? Uh, why are they on the pier? Kind of stuff. And so it's all in there. And I, you know, I'm there for it when I make the whole thing. And I think... You might want to see the whole thing. I don't know. Anyway, I started to twist this marble. I'm making a marble, remember? <laughs> and what I'm noticing in this is that since the dots were so close to the edge, on the disc, they've changed shapes and flattened out to really become like these razor thin planes whirling through that middle layer of the marble. And it's a it's kind of a cool deconstruction um, because a lot of times for my designs, I'm essentially doing a, a weird cross section through just one dot in the middle where I'm twisting it and then rotating it in several different ways. And here, instead of putting the dot in the middle, I'm putting them dots around the edge of that disc and then spinning it. So you can see it's more like a ring of its elements. And then we'll be able, we should be able to look like right through and see what's happening with that silver maelstrom in the middle. So we'll have several things going on. We'll have the white lines on the outside drawing your eye around in a circle. We'll have in the middle, you'll have these little schmoo shaped razor blades angrily vying for, you know, their little piece of that silver in the middle that they can never touch. And in the middle is the silver uh, whirlwind. Then if you turn off the light, you'll see a whole nother drama going on in the black light UV spectrum. So, I'm starting to sphere up this a little bit. I go, I use a marble mold, graphite marble mold. I start off in a hemisphere that's bigger than my marble, roughly shaping it. And then I'll go to using just the rim of one that's a smaller diameter, rotating it, changing the axis of rotation. And that really starts the marble being spherical. You can't see so much what's going on on the inside because since the 
The graphite draws a lot of heat out of the marble and chills the surface. It makes it ripply, so you're not really seeing all the detail inside. Anyway, I want to, I don't want this to get too cold. I uh, spent a little bit too much time in the mold, uh, just giving this an approximate spherical shape. But what I want to do now is I want to switch my axis again and rotate it just a little bit on another axis. And that's going to take those layers um, and start merging them together. So you don't have, you know, we talked about the, what's happening on the outside, what's happening on the middle, and what's happening in the center. And then the UV middle, what's happening there. And so now we're going to blur the lines a little bit and make it harder to follow. Which some people might like. Some people might just say, this marble is great. Stop messing with it. You're going to ruin it. It's too much, too far. Stop it, George. They might be right. <laughs> I'm going to poke it again. It's my marble. I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> It'll still be cool. But I'm not going to do a lot to it. It's going to still have this, but the basic spiral shape. But I'm going to give it just like a quarter or a half a turn to show well, for technical reasons, I'm showing my control over the substance. I'm showing that I can make this glass do what I want. It does, it has times when it does what it wants. And I'm not like sledgehammering it through a square hole or anything like that. I'm using a blowtorch to finesse it through the eye of a needle. And it's going to resolve in a few seconds. Let's start to see. Out of that extra oof, just a little, eh, little twist of the knife. Now I'm just going to heat it. And this is my Christmas snowstorm. it and start getting it round again. As you can see, it started to take on a little football shape as I was twisting it. Um, I was trying to get the heat and the, and the turn, the twisting motion to go into the center of the marble, and it's so easy to heat up the surface of the marble, and the attachment points at the surface of the marble are these metal handles that I've got. They're attached to the surface, and so they want to twist fast and the middle wants to resist the, uh, uh, the middle, or uh, the twist. So, pulling it out a little bit like that just gives me a little extra action in the middle of the marble where I can keep the surface of the marble, especially near those attachment points, cool. Oops. my marble off my handle. Get back on there. There we go. There. <laughs> I was let the attachment point or the metal attaches to the marble get too cool and it cracked off. 
So now I'm going to heat up the whole thing again. got some surface damage from the paint on the cement board. So I'm going to try to pull that off without ruining my white lines too badly. So they won't be perfect anymore, although what is? <laughs> All right, so now let's reshape the sphericalness of that marble on the unattached side. All right, we got spherical. And then, but the surface is not smooth. There you can see all the way through it. Wow. So let's heat it and we'll just let it try to use surface tension so it pulls itself smooth. And the rotation and controlling this angle is going to improve my spherical shape a little bit more. And then for my last shaping on this side of the marble, this unattached side, I'm going to use a cherry wood marble mold, which I have resting in water behind me. It's basically a wooden paddle with holes drilled through it that I pre-burned in uh, like a, an arc, a radius. So let that calm down just a second, heat-wise. Here's my cherry wood paddle. Use each of those little arcs for a few seconds. And now, my last attachment point is going to be just a little glass rod. Clear glass rod up, get it to a little point, not too small of a point. Get the surface temperature of the marble just right, and the surface temperature of the rod just right, and let them just touch. Make sure they're centered, a little rotation, and then I'm going to melt off that metal handle that's in my hand right here. a little nub. When it's hot, you can see that there might be a little particle of the stainless steel in there. And because the stainless steel has been heated and cooled and heated and cooled, it's basically just a little piece of iron, not steel. All the carbon is burned out. There was also a little bubble in there, which I went and got with my tweezers. Now it's gone. And so my white lines got kind of messed up from the, the when this marble fell off and hit the cement board. It made little fuzzy patches, and I went to tweeze them out. I tried to do it carefully, but almost impossible. So sir design if your marble takes a tumble you can go over top of it 
sometimes, but with this design where it's clear with just that little tiny white line. See, there's a messed up. Anyway, it'll be fine. You'll see it tomorrow. I'll post pictures. I think it came out pretty cool. I'll make some more of these this week. And I still have to try to make that loop, the Whirlpool Galicia that I made last week. I want to make a few of those to have laying around. And I had uh, someone ask about one. I wanted to be able to reproduce it before I let go of the original. <laughs> I genuinely don't like to sell the demos anyway. I just keep them all in my display. front of my studio so when people come in they can see like, especially if they've been watching uh, online or you know they've come in years past to the demos like oh this is that model you made from you know that time I was here so oh look, there it is when I first started doing the internet demonstrations I did I was giving out a few of them as prizes but I was like yeah I think we want to keep those Oh, it was a shipping killer. All right, almost round. Oh, I'm pretty smooth. It's going to look better when it cools down because the colors, a lot of the stuff is either invisible or it looks black or it looks red hot. Um, so instead of looking red or green, it looks like basically a uh, nightmarish hellscape of color. That nightmarish hellscape, that'll be the first, uh, um, whatever that band name we had. <laughs> Alright, so I've got, I can see the reflection of the lights above me on the surface of the glass. And that's when I can tell the, the surface is smooth and I've gotten rid of a lot of the ripples from any of my tool marks. Uh, either the graphite marble molds or just it not being as spherical as I like. So, but I'm, I'm letting it get really heated on the surface so it pulls in smooth. And then I'm just going to let it relax for a few seconds, and then I'm going to have, hit it one more time with the uh, cherry wood marble paddles. Let's do that now. Just a few seconds for each one. So I'm letting it spin. You can see it continue to spin after I let it go. That means that we really got it spherical. If it's just really rotating like that, riding on its layer of uh, steam. And so there we go. So now I'm going to use my scissors and chill that area while I'm whole cradling the marble in a fireproof uh, tile. And then we'll tap that this rod off, pick up the torch and chill or uh, flame polish that last mark off. So there, I've tapped that rod off. I'm going to pick up the torch. I'm just going to tap the torch. You've seen me do this before. I don't know if I've explained it. Getting the carbon out, any loose carbon, so it doesn't deposit on my marble. As I go to heat that last little attachment point where that last glass rod was holding on to the marble. I heat the area pretty strongly and then I let it rest, and it merges into the background, hopefully without making a mark of oxidation where those last um, silica tetraoxide bombs were left open. Now I'm going to pick up the tweezers I made for mar making mar or, uh, transferring marbles. I have all different size little 
loops depending on the marble that I've made. So heat these up to red and then I let them go to black. And that's when they're at the right temperature to go and pick up my marble. And now I'm going to go put it in the annealing oven. I'll hold it at 950 for about two hours. And so, in the two hours, while we're waiting for that marble to anneal, we're all write a 20-page essay on uh, how you make glass marbles. So, um, let's begin. Go get your pens and your notebooks and... No, I'm kidding. We won't do that. <laughs> Just got to quench those tweezers because it's a thousand degrees. And I'm going to bleed my lines before I quit for the evening and the first thing I'm going to do is shut off my oxygen regulator. I'm going to shut off the high side, let the high side pressure breathe down to the low side, then I'm going to shut off the low side. So here's the high side, low side, and then the needle valve, and I wonder if that's my car. Keys. I thought that was me. Yep, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate those things. All right, now I'm shutting off the propane. My car alarm was going off. <laughs> All right, and uh, that's it for today. I also, I'm just going to talk about making very tiny beads, because like this would be a, a pretty small bead. These are even tinier. And so I'm looking for beads to replace these little metal beads up at the top. But I want to make handmade beads up there. And so part of that was making the bead beginnings out of these small pots. Um, that's for a different demonstration. <laughs> but for now, uh, thanks for watching. I will go back and answer any questions and uh, post the pictures of that marble tomorrow. All right, have a great night, and I'll see you next week.